Ray Hudson, Patricia LeBon Herb, Peg Coldman, Kathleen McKinley Harris, David Weinstock. I gave David permission to read for more than five minutes. I think he deserves it. <laughs> okay. So um, I want to welcome you. This is a pretty special reading because it's National Poetry Month. And <clears throat> last year we had the Greeley poets from Pulteney, and this year we have the Otter Creek poets from Middlebury. Because the features, multiple features. So I, I think open mics are pretty special because you never know what you're going to get. And actually, this reading is pretty special because I have no idea <laughs> what we're going to get. <laughs> Aside from committing to be here, we really haven't, nothing else has been coordinated. So it's all a surprise. So our first open mic reader is Sam B. Let's give her a hand. A courageous first reader of the night. <laughs> the sacrificial poet, <laughs> if I may. Um, so how much time um, is I think, um, good for? Well, I was thinking of, I, 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 let me see. I had thought one poem each because we had so many readers. Right. So if that's OK. Yeah, that works good. perfectly. Unless it's two short ones. No, I'll just do one, like, okay. medium-ish. Well, maybe slightly long, but yeah, not too fine. long. So. That's great. <laughs> I'm actually working on one. I'm actually working on one. But All right. Uh, this is a poem I actually wrote. I forget if it was the end of last month or the beginning of this month, but um, I have read it twice now and have gotten a fairly good response from it, so I figured I would read it here as well. Um, it's called Made Unmade. Before birth, my role is determined. The gifts color-coded for public consumption, nameless, faceless child given an unwanted future. I float unaware of the body surrounding me, mother, surrounded by bodies of her own, a small house on a charming cul-de-sac. The Atlantic only a few miles away, several minutes traveled in the body of a brown minivan. Further still, bodies of research pile up to be dismissed for years on the fringes of psychology. The same year, a book-length essay by Judith Butler argues that sexed bodies are socially constructed as early feminist arguments maintained only gender was. And gender is performative, but not a performance, as I am wrapped in a blue cotton blanket on the day of my birth, September 6, 1990, as I am placed in a chamber under warm, bright lights and unheld for five days, as my mother waits to be able to embrace her child, her boy, as nurses remark how this is quite atypical, then so is the fact that doctors forced my mother into labor before she was ready. For my body was thusly delivered twice, once to a glass box to be monitored and stared at, once to my parents desperate to welcome baby home. If they knew who I would become, would they have left me in there, raised by neglect and rejection, abuse, threats, and harassment? Did they? I am three years old when Brandon Tina is raped and murdered in 1993. I know nothing of these dangers when I recuse myself, hide my body in clothes intended for others. The last year of my childhood that I have long hair, I nearly die in a skiing accident in 1996. I still wonder if this tragedy would have saved me from suffering. A woman comes over, my family in a circle staring. She asks, is your sister all right? If only goggles did not obscure my vision, they all would have seen the glimmer of hope as I sat up, recognized for the first time. Instead, he's my brother, my sibling says. Two days after Thanksgiving, 1998, Rita Hester is murdered less than three hours away from where I am, safe in my rural New Hampshire home, probably eating leftovers or else finishing up a school project. Trans Day of Remembrance is created soon after, honoring every trans person killed each year. There's a sick irony to the fact that we can only stand up and be counted among the dead. In 2004, I am homesick from school. I hide in the bathroom wearing my younger sister's sky blue floral print dress. She comes home and I call to her, ask if I can show her something. She says she'll wait. I try so hard to work up the nerve to come out. An hour passes, I pretend it was nothing. 
This would repeat a few years later, but I am in her room and leave myself no out. She sees me in skirt and blouse, says nothing. We act like it never happened. I begin to privately disclose to best friends and anyone who will listen that I would have rather been born a girl when the truth is I was just a different kind. Julia Serrano's Excluded is one of the first major works in modern transfeminist thought. It's 2007. I drink excessively to numb the pain. Two weeks into my freshman year of college, I celebrate my 18th birthday by drinking so much I puke as I sleep. I avoid choking to death by just a few inches. Summer 2009, I declare to all, I am a girl, I am trans, I medicalize myself to make my identity more palatable, I even convince myself they believe me. I flip the world upside down and live a life I never thought I could. Every boy, man, sir, policed, body, mind, soul, and I feel the sting of these assumptions paid up with interest 2010. Each day after I live in fear as I experience the worst of humanity, bottles thrown, threats made, jobs lost, housing withheld, and now I'm told I'm the danger. You see only what you want to see. I may have been made in his image, but I was remade in my own, and I am unmade here in this glass box as you gaze on. Thank you. Hey, Sam. Hey. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and thank you for your trust in sharing it with us. Thank you very, very much. Sam's read at a lot of open mics here and she's part of a um, poetry group in Pulteney that I'm also part of uh, with another group of poets. But really great. Thank you. Okay, Tom Gutman is our next poet. Let's welcome him. They're short. I've been out this a while, and this is this is new stuff. <clears throat> Toll ahead, driving backwards up the wrong way ramp. I try to enter, but I always seem to be exiting. The winds of change are blowing through my underwear. The exit number keeps changing, <laughs> right in front of my eyes. Maps are for losers. I use the infinity principle. I never know where I've been or where I'm going. I never ask. I'm a guy. <laughs> Any mode of transportation will do fine. So on your next journey, keep them guessing. Drive backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, literacy. That book is wildly overdue, sneer the insult librarian. It's way over your head, completely out of your league. Anything to check out? Well, at least you read, turn pages, use a bookmark. The insult librarian is impressed. She digs your moves, but st you'll still pay the late fee. If you're a good boy, you'll get to visit the reference room. The insult librarian is waiting for you in leather, fish, fishnets, whips, and cords. <laughs> Punishment can be so sweet. She's fiction stacked with legs up to the Arctic. But do you really care? The insult librarian will still be there. <laughs> so, is that good enough? No, you, you have another one? You can do yeah. I just like that. <laughs> I think, I think he pronounces Finis. A little bird told me the end is always near. Depends on which end you're talking about. Probably the one we all fear. There's the end of a movie, the finish of a song. A day's work is over. Sun's rays are gone. Winter is better than nothing. Nothing is better than the end. Can't really see tomorrow. Yesterday is my friend. So they can burn us up or bury us in the ground. Pour our ashes in a cup. Gotta go. Can't stick around. <laughs> Thank you. So you good? Thank you. Thank you I got, so you know, the principle. Yeah. 
bite a bunch and then you get a good one. That's great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks. Are you from around here? Are you from Brandon? Yeah. Oh, great. Hope you'll be back. <laughs> be sure to sign the mailing list. Yes. Be sure to sign the mailing yes. list. Okay, then our third open reader is Caitlin Gildrian. Is that Caitlin? Did I pronounce it correctly? No. Yeah, there's a, there's a chair up here. Roman, you want to come up here, Sophia? Hi. <clears throat> Tongue and bones. One. My aunt to my mother, apocryphally. Once I left that house, I swore I'd never eat tongue again. My mother's blank confusion, a betrayal, a confirmation of all that she didn't suffer, younger child of the second better marriage, and my grandmother's equal resolve never again to buy it once she could, once she could afford a muscle cut. Two. It takes seven days of heavy salted brine to rid the calf's tongue of the deep need in its suckle. Even then, the pebbled skin must be peeled away. Ten inches long, in a Pyrex dish, clouding the bottom shelf of my fridge, anointed with peppercorns, allspice, onion, it looks every bit what it is. The root end, a raw echo of that first severing, the cow's bellow and his ball seeking each other across the dark aisles of the barn. Three, we know that survivors of famine breed thrift into the very blood of their children, born braced for hunger. You can buy chicken broth now in coffee cups with paper sleeves in Brooklyn, and my grandmother is dead. The only recipe I have in her hand is for Christmas fudge. Still, I choose cans of whole sardines, lift them out shimmering, and chew the tender bones. Four. A calf will take two fingers in place of the longed for teeth, and, if you let it, will suck there for a long time. His eyes roll back, tail pumps in time to the pumping of that brawny tongue, the hard gums grinding, your fingers slick, then wrinkled, then sore, Poor comfort, poor comfort for a motherless child. I mean, I have more. Okay. Um, oh, God, I just lost it. Um... Okay, this is a brand new one, um, and it's half here. <laughs> marsh hymn. Praise to the three girls catching salamanders by the marsh's edge, having found no frogs. Praise their soggy nets. Praise the gop and suck of mud, the shrieks when their boots get stuck, the fishy smell that rises. Praise the salamanders, their drab brown backs, their orange spotted bellies, their ease of being caught. Praise also the little brothers poking the ground with sticks, wailing at impassable mud. Praise the silvering light, the buds fattening along each branch, the damp mat of leaves studded with pine cones, strewn with rotten logs. Praise these girls again, the green pith of their limminess, the paper boats of curiosity they push out again and again, never needing yet to draw them back. Praise their crouching bodies, peering into the water, seeing past both the darkness and the sky. Thank you. I live in Leicester. Oh, you live in Leicester? Yeah. Wow. How did you find us? That's great. Um, I'm happy that you I mean, did. We, we live in Leicester. So you live in Leicester, town. so you heard about <laughs> us. So that's great. I hope you come back. Yeah, thank you. So thanks. Anyone else for Open Reader? Anyone that came in late? Okay, so thank you, open readers. Usually what we try to do is alternate prose and poetry. So this is our poetry. Next week, next month will be prose, and then poetry again in June. And when we have the poetry readings, we always have an open mic. So we hope to see you back. That's great. Okay, so now we're going to have um, 
are poet poets who have been working with David Weinstock, who started the Otter Creek Poetry Workshop more than 20 years ago. And it's the longest running continuous workshop of its kind in Vermont. I participate when I can. There was a time when I went more regularly and it made a huge difference in my writing to be able to share with poets of the quality that you're going to hear. Um, the group meets weekly for two hours at the Isley Public Library in Middlebury. It's open to anyone who is interested. Um, you don't have to sign up. You can just go. What it, it meets for two hours at the Isley Public Library on Thursday afternoons from 1 to 3. Participants range from beginning poets to long established and published writers. Both groups of poets find the workshop affirming and helpful. This is evident from the longevity of the program and the fact that it draws participants from near Burlington, Bennington, and even White River Junction as well as Hanover, New Hampshire, and from across Lake Champlain in New York. I mean, that's a big draw. And I've been really astonished at the people who drive two hours to come to that meeting. The atmosphere of the weekly meetings is convivial and serious at the same time. It's a really great group. I can't recommend it enough. It's just the most supportive group that I've ever been involved in. And I've been involved in um, groups in New York, and I love my Pulteney group, too. I could be saying the same thing, but um, each poem that is presented receives the benefit of undivided attention from sister and fellow poets and from David Weinstock, the workshop leader. The attitude is always one of respect and a spirit of generous suggestions as to possible ways to clarify the writing. It's not one of these places where <coughs> nothing like that. However, it's extremely serious, and so the feedback that you get is really honest. And you could get the range, someone giving you this and someone giving you that. And if you go for a while, you sort of understand where the voice is coming from, and you find where you are in the middle, you know. But it's a, it's, I think it's a really extraordinary, extraordinarily open-minded and supportive group. The workshop benefits from David Weinstock's vast knowledge of poetry and his ability to focus on what is ultimately the most important about a poem. Subject matter ranges from memoir, nature, historical events, psychological queries, and political satire and humor. It's all over the map. It's probably what we're going to get tonight. The Otter Creek Poets have published three collections, By the Waterfall, Maps and Voyages, and Line by Line. Do we have some here tonight? They're pretty much all sold out. Mamma mia. Well, we need to republish them. <laughs> some of the individual poets have books for sale, too. So I'd like to welcome David Weinstock at this point to have him say a few words of introduction for the group. So let's, without David, this would not exist. Well, B's covered it pretty well. Um, I do invite anyone who's writing to come, Sam and Caitlin and Tom, just join us. Um, uh, I, uh, I had no intention of doing any such thing. Uh, all I knew was that I had started writing poetry again after I went to Breadloaf Writers Conference when we moved to Vermont. And I realized that all the poems I'd ever written in my whole life had been usually on the day or the day before going to a workshop. And so, you know, I, I've, I've done journalism. If you're a journalist, they say, we need this by Tuesday at 5 o'clock. But if you're a poet, nobody ever says that to you. <laughs> Nobody's waiting for it. There's not a deadline. And so having a workshop deadline is good for your productivity and good for your spirits. And <clears throat> um, so that was one thing. I wanted to have a deadline for myself. And most of the poems I've written in the last 20 years have been on Thursday mornings. Um, um, the, the tone of the, uh, we try to keep it very humane. Um, it's, it's gets even more humane when there are new members. We do get to know each other pretty well, and, but new members seem to sort of reset us to, uh, civility. Um, I, I've been in workshops where the, where the, um, poet, the celebrity poet is, is pretty harsh. It's what I call professional birth control. They, they look out at, you know, the 10 students and they say, that one's good, that one's good. So the rest of you, why don't you just stop? Just stop writing. 
And I, I don't do that um, because I think the thing that improves writing the most is doing it and doing it over a course of months and years and goodness, decades. So I've, I would like to be encouraging and encouraging seems to work and seems to make people write better over the long term. Um, so anyway, thank you all for being part of it. And uh, anyone who wants to join, please join us. Um, we do meet weekly. And that's one of the success things about it is that it's weekly. It's not first and third anything or second and fourth anything. It's weekly. So it's kind of like church. You know, you know it's there, you know, on a particular day, a particular time. And that seems to be one of the reasons that people come. Um, because it's Thursday afternoon during the week, uh, the population of it tends to be not to be young people particularly, uh, but we do welcome people who come and we like the people who come who lower our average age by several years. Um, and it's always good to, good to get new voices and new, uh, new sounds. So um, thanks for coming. And um, I look forward to the video of this uh, yeah. interesting. I don't think we've ever recorded ourselves doing know, anything really like before. Thing. So That's so. why we had it on Thursday night, because Arlen can video it. <laughs> so thanks to B and, the, and to the shop for, for putting this together. You, very persistent and I was very unhelpful. <laughs> You're here, that's the main yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thanks so much. Thank you. So, Thank okay. you very much. Well, thank you, David, and we deeply, deeply appreciate everything that you've done and continue to do, really. Okay, our first reader is Ron Lewis, and Ron Lewis is from Brandon. But he's a native Californian who moved to Vermont in 1979 and has lived in Brandon since that time and is now retired. And it might almost qualify him as a Vermonter, right? <laughs> How many years? Like 40 years or something? <laughs> he spent nine years in college, has a major in accounting and a minor in English. He studied creative writing and poetry with Stan Rice, Anne Rice's husband, Kay Boyle, and Denise Levertoff. He founded the Green Mountain Astronomers, Green Mountain Fly Tires and Fly Fishing Club, and Green Mountain Table Tennis Club, and the New England Panther Research Alliance. He's an amateur astronomer, a watercolorist, gardener, nationally acclaimed fly tire, gold prospector, fluorescent mineral collector, and vintage Valentine card collector. <laughs> He's a Mayflower descendant and was a Vermont fly fishing guide for 17 years and the editor of the popular 150-page online Vermont Poetry Newsletter and Poetry Event Calendar. Do you sleep at all? <laughs> so let's welcome Ron Lewis. <laughs> it's quite a bio. The bio reads like a poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll do. I saw that we had a preteen here in the audience, which was unexpected. So I had to throw out half of everything I brought today. Oh, dear. <laughs> and because we have so many seniors, I had to throw out the other half. So that'll be it. <laughs> I didn't know what to read. This is for you. Did you like, you like this one? Ransacked. My wife wants a burglar who will take it all. <laughs> Kick in the door and strip us blind have no sense of value, show no mercy. A robbery so complete, she will forget what we once owned, swearing they're only things. Through the cartilage of hallways, we will close our eyes, but we'll leave the moonlight on while the street lights struggle so we can see his silhouette fog past us. A thief who will steal even the freckles drawn on the small, of her scrimshaw white back, an orange meteor shower brailing delicately across her shoulders, traveling the length of her body, where my lips snap along the curve of her neck, smooth as sheets worn thin as breath. She said we need to start clean, wants the man to rob her of her gray hair. Grandmother's best bone china and clavicle teacups, fence the television, and while he's at it, launder the family cat, <laughs> the iguana, the metaphors, strip the wallpaper of its yellow finches, 
then take the baby with its bath water. She won't have to show him the difference between dime store jewelry and emerald brooches, because deal is, it all goes. <laughs> Doesn't even want him to leave us a pot to piss in. Just a promise not to talk or even blink when we hear the dropping of silverware on the way out, poking out of the holes of his canvas bag. And please don't forget the dead Fords and Buicks out back, back. <laughs> the kitchen sink, the sound of milk going sour, the Steinway, drawers full of derivatives and anything lower than tree line or in the food chain than us. When he's done, when he's done, you've promised to be like the brideless horse, bridleless horse, excuse me, breaking out of its burning barn, <coughs> running out into the night, letting the silence close in around you, swallowing you whole in the orchard that used to be there. Mm. <laughs> Can we read that? I read this once a year. Open mic. <laughs> you will notice that my poems lie open like pairs of red-handled scissors asking you to pick each one up and slice open their hard stillness or see if they tear as easily as tissue or if marbles come spilling out of their tiny velvet cloth bags. You are welcome to shine a light at them to see if their words phosphoresce, or if they stand frozen in their tracks like deer. Hand them guns to see if they serve and protect, or with a single poem loaded into a chamber, play Russian roulette, pressing the barrel into your mouth, wondering if the poem will pass through your flesh or bury itself in your subconscious. I should ask you to run them over with your cars to see if you feel a thud or hand them a tin.